everybody. I'm Steve Harper uh, from yourcreativelife.com. I'm here with my buddy, Brooks Elms, who's a screenwriter extraordinaire and uh, also uh, a writing co coach and guru, as am I. And uh, what are we doing here today, Brooks? We're just talking about how I'm a guru, because I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it, it's funny to that word. So we are we are talking about um, uh, the outreach game, um, because to my mind, um, our, your talent level is this, right? And um, you have, you know, X amount of chance of success based on your talent level. But if you uh, you have if your outreach game is good, you will one X or two X or five X or maybe even 10 X your chances of success um, by. Uh, and, and there's all sorts of fun ways I like to help writers um, up level their outreach game. So, um, so I thought yeah. it'd be fun to do um, talk about some of your because you got really great ideas too. Um, yeah. And 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 I thought it would be fun to kind of talk about some ways of approaching it from getting staff, the ways of approaching it when trying to sell script, see what's similar, what's different, and have some fun. Yeah. So basically, we're talking about our top three uh, thoughts about how to either sell your script or get yourself staffed on a TV show. Um, yeah. And so. Uh, yeah, I'll actually go first. So, so it's interesting because, um, yeah, we were just talking about this a little bit a, a little bit ago. My first one really is very fundamental, and that is just to write stuff. You got to just write stuff. For TV, it's sort of like TV changes a whole bunch. You know, it morphs like you know, streaming is is obviously relatively new. It's not completely brand new, but there are all kinds of TV shows. And I think the more you are leaning into your writing chops to figure out what is your, the voice of you in the TV universe, like that's a huge part of, of the entire process of establishing who you are, whether it's to reps or to yourself or to buyers or to execs or to people who are hiring. So just to be in the process of writing TV related stuff is is one of my big tips. Nice. I like that. So are you suggesting then with that tip that some people are kind of leaning into the outreach game too soon or 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 before they've really done the work on the writing side? Yeah, I mean I I feel like I feel like the thing that most people want to know when they hire a writer for TV is a can they write? Like, you know, can they just put words on the page and create scenes that are dynamic and interesting and characters and all that stuff? Uh, but then, like, who are they as a person? So I feel like often what happens is, you know, when you write, when you write pilot after pilot, you know, script after script, not in some sort of obsessive way, but when you're in the practice of it, you get the chance to not only be creating work, but then to sort of own your philosophy about it. You're suddenly like, I like this kind of show rather than that kind of show. I'm really trying to do this. I'm really trying to say that, right? And I think if you don't, I think when I first got into the game, I sort of thought, oh, you plug yourself into somebody else's universe. And yes, as a fact, you do, but you really have to be bringing your own universe so that people go, oh, I like your universe. Let's see how your, your universe fits into my universe. And to do that, you gotta be creating a universe. Excellent, got it, okay. Um, I appreciate that. and and I And I, what I really like about that tip is this idea of showing up as you, showing up as the thought leader that you are. Um, and you can't do that unless you're writing. Um, you know, that, so to me, my tips were um, kind of assuming that you were doing that part, but like it absolutely is worth mentioning because if you are not fully showing up, writing what you were born to write, really owning your own voice and vision and way of impacting the audience, then yeah, then it's, it's a non-starter. You, you, yeah. you, you should be on stuff. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that's one of mine. What's, cool. what's, what's one of yours? The one on the top of my list is having fun. Um, F-U-N, fun. And, um, and that's, a, that's a tricky word, especially with outreach, because it's not fun for a lot of writers. Um, but if that particular word isn't good, you writers swap it out with another word. It's sort of like an embracing of the process really, or a flow state. That's actually probably even a better way of saying it, that there is a flow state that you can be in when you do outreach. Um, if you induce it, if you make choices to allow it to come up, because a lot of times writers are com comfortable with the flow state of creating stuff. 
And then for interesting reasons, they flip the switch and say, yeah, but I can't network. I can't meet people. I can't whatever. Yeah. And, um, and I absolutely feel like that part of us that loves to tell stories and create stories is when we meet new people that might be our kindred spirits, it can come from the same place. That when I'm at my best, and it's not always, but when I'm at my best, I generally am meeting new people that might be um, great for my projects by um, by just coming from the love of my story. You know, I love my story because of this and that. And, oh, I'm meeting this person who might also love my story. Um, and that is so joyous. And to me, it's joyous in the same way as me sort of writing the script. So me writing the script and relating to people who might be a part of being in the project, to me, is a continuum. And I invite any writer that's that's looking at this to cultivate it being a continuum for you because the more you do the outreach and the more you are, are masterful at the outreach part, the more success you'll have. Yeah, that's, I, I love that. I love that. Because there is a way in which, you know, you are, it, it, you know, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like leaning into what you love about like your favorite person, you know? It's like, if I'm able to say, oh my goodness, like this thing is really fun about them and this thing is really fun about them and I was really excited about this and they told me about that, right? It's that same energy that translates into what I think you're talking about. It is, and there's a really fascinating thing. Um, and I started doing this when I, I taught a, a class at UCLA Extension and I do it um, sometimes in, in my own programs where I, I have people talk about their favorite stuff. Talk, tell me about your couple favorite shows, a couple of movies, and you see their energy go whoop. And they're going, oh, I love this. I love that. And, and it's all, it's just delightful. They're just bursting with joy because it's what we love talking about. We can watch that movie or show a million times. It's like totally joy. And then those same people go, well, tell me about what you're writing. And they're going, I'm writing. <laughs> it's apology. It's, you know, it's yeah. like, well, hold on a second. So one of the things I do in my program is, is try to bridge that. I go, no, no, start talking about your favorite stuff keep that energy flowing at that really fun, unattached, playful, I love it, I love it, and then let it transition to your own stuff. And that sort of practice of just matter-of-factly talking about your own stuff with the same way you're easily able to talk about your favorite stuff is a really nice, infectious way of getting on people's radars. Yeah, that's super cool. I really like that. And that that actually yeah. sort of dovetails into my my second one, which, cool. you know, what is it? We had this whole conversation about coordinating and whether that, you know, but here's, you know, so my second one really is, again, very fundamental, like the first one, which was right. Second one is to watch stuff and to read stuff that's happening mm -hmm. now, right? Because mm -hmm. here's the thing, like everybody in television, uh, at least most of the people that I know, we're all watching television, right? Most, obviously, if you're, you're super busy, you could be super busy on a show, all that stuff. But you got to watch stuff in order to make stuff, I think. And often, you know, I've talked to people and have friends, too, who've either pitched to me or are interested in getting into TV. And they're citing shows like, you know, MASH or like Mad Men or like, and those shows are great. But those are a long time ago. If you're not, if you're not be able to, you know, as you talked about, like the fun stuff. You got to be able to download from what's happening right now to be able to, uh, I think, ultimately connect to the people who are selling and buying now, the people who are making shows, the people who are creating stuff. And in order to do that, you just got to be watching all the new stuff. It doesn't mean you need to love all the new stuff. There's plenty of newer stuff that I'm sort of like, eh. but at least I've sampled it, you know, so I can speak about it and I can say I, I gear more, you know, veer more to this kind of work than that kind of work. So to watch and read stuff that's happening today, it's being made today. I, I love that. That reminds me of, I love thinking of the, 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 the Hollywood, you know, mo, you know movies and, and, and TV shows as like a giant campfire. It's like you're sitting around the campfire with some friends. It's like, you know, you know what story do we tell next? You yeah. know? And it's based on what, who just told the last story. So if you tell a story and it's a scary story, and if I then go, oh, I'm going to tell a story next, and it's like not quite as scary as your story, <laughs> then you're like, oh, it's kind of like not, no, we want to move it forward. So then if, if, if I go, okay, now I'm going to tell a story and it's going to be, you know, similar but different. You'll go, oh, I'm going to tell it. It's even going to be scarier or it's going to be a scary story with a funny twist or mm -hmm. there's going to be a romance to it or, or whatever. But like now I'm progressing the kind of communal conversation. And so I love what you're talking about there because if you're not actively watching stuff from that genre, 
um, and like going, ooh, I love that they did this and this feels new and this feels, and then you're writing something that feels like it's the next wave of the genre. Um, it, you're right. It, it's it's just it just to as much as we love the classics, they're um, they're good for references in a deeper way. Some of the structure choices, some of the thematic sure. things can work, but there's um, there's a freshness to what's being chosen this year, last year. That's really important to get the timing right, and timing is such a huge part. I, th I think the other thing about that too that that you know I think you're so right. But the people who you're meeting with for these shows. They, they're producing shows. They might have produced that show that was on last year, but they might not have produced the show that was on 10 years ago. You know, so you're, if you're able to be able to, you know, to converse in all of these things that are happening, same for the showrunners. They might have created or worked on the show that was on last season. If you don't know that show, you're at a disadvantage. Even just one thing. If, if you, so if I'm a, I'm a producer or a network, right, and, I, and, I, and I'm choosing between two writers, um, one writer's favorite show or what was passionate talking about something that came out last year. Another writer's talking about something that came out 10 years ago. Everything else is equal. Right. Which one is, am I more likely to hire? Well, the person that's more current, the one that's more excited about what's going on now, not 10 yes. years ago. Even yes. if it's like a classic movie for, or a show from 10 years ago, it's, there really is a timeliness thing that's just... Um, that's just inherent because they're because they're playing to audiences now. Though, what do people want to watch now? Right. And so, um, and things are in deeper ways similar to what happened ten years. But there's also a a, a, a freshness that happens that, that shifts a little bit. So, yeah, timeliness is, is, is very significant. Yeah, yeah. All right. So that was my number two. What's your number two? My number two is um, uh, Steve. It's a little controversial. Uh oh, <laughs> not too good for so. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, people will in in the in the feature world be like, "Who can I who can I pitch my script to?" And they're pitching they're pitching way too early to people that aren't even well targeted. So you got to target your real kindred spirits. Find the people who are making your favorite films, making your um your your favorite films and the films that are adjacent to what you're you're writing. Um, and then get into like real conversations with them as people. Not as a stepping stone, not as a, um, uh, you know, you're not using them and you're not, by goodness, you're not pitching them. What you're doing, the way in coming from that idea of let's have this be fun and playful in a flow state is you um, you make your list of people that are made your favorite stuff and and are, are and have made stuff that's that's adjacent to what you're doing now. And then you, there's so many, there's probably a hundred people on that list. If you take your 10 favorite uh, films, 10 favorite shows, and then um, 10, 10 most adjacent material films and shows and then you just start figuring out who they are over half those people are on social media you look at what they're posting about on social media and you go um and you just get in a conversation with them oh they posted about such and such charity or this sports team or whatever it's even better if it's outside of the business and then you just if it's genuine you don't force it if they're talking about nothing you're interested in leave them alone um, but if there's an opportunity to genuinely connect with them as a potential kindred spirit, um, oh, you know what? Yeah, I actually, you know, um, you know, I, I like that sports team too. Or, oh, did you see such and such on that team? Do whatever, whatever it is, right? And, but now, and if there's a little bit of exchange, oh, I like that comment. Now the door is opened a little bit. You know what I mean? And then maybe you go back again, not forcing it, but maybe you go back, who knows, a couple days later, a week later, you go, oh, by the way, uh, IMDb says you, you produced this one show or whatever, or this one, you know, this film. Um, and then you can ask them what I call a catnip question. It's, it's a question that's so irresistible that they can easily answer in like five seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds. Or if they want, they can actually give you a longer answer, 30 seconds or whatever. But it's a really fascinating question. So if an example might be, um, oh, you produced such and such movie. Um, and that one location, uh, you know, was like uh, up in the Arctic. Was, was that on a soundstage or did you guys uh, were able to shoot that someplace else? It's a really easy, easy thing for, and the, but now you're, you're not fan geeking on them and you're not like saying, Hey, will you read my script or anything? You are having a peer to peer shop talk experience. And, um, and that's just the beginning. I mean, you can ask them about any, you can ask them if it's depending on who, who it is and what their involvement is. You might ask them about theme. You might ask them about just something that you are, again, if you are a great writer, you are a thought leader about your sensibility. So you, you bring up some sort of 
perspective you have on the work they did and, and ask them an insightful question that could be easily answered. And that cracks that door open here. And again, not everybody, some people will just ghost you, but like you'll probably get, if you target well, one in three people responding and then it goes like that. And then, and then if an organic conversation happens, right? Then it goes through. And then they, what they'll do is they'll click over to your profile. And if you have that uh, created in a way that shares your superpower, they'll get a hit of that emotion that you're good at delivering. And they'll go, wow, this person's really interesting. And now they're going to go, what? What's going on? What are you working on? And now you pitch them a little bit. Again, it's just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. But, but now your or, your relationship is organically, and that is a more enjoyable experience for you and for them. It's fun. It's not like muscling through networking, blah, 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 which nobody likes to do because you're bothering people and adding to noise. This is, hey, let's have a good conversation. I think this is fun. I don't know. This is that interesting conversation for you. And 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 again, maybe one of three will go, oh, yeah, that's interesting. Bum, 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 and it goes. So that's, that's my... Uh, the, to, to sort of encapsulate it, it's sell conversation, not your script. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, which actually, again, dovetails into my my third piece here. And I think it's so interesting because this, this is the piece that people get really confused about or freaked out about. And, and so for me, the third one, third thing that I want to mention is networking. Now, we hear the word and some people are like, start shaking, you know, because it seems so monumental. Right. But here's the thing about about Hollywood and the way the industry works. I, you know, I always use this analogy. It's sort of like you don't want to be homeless. Right. So the homeless analogy is this happens to us all the time, all across the country, all across the world. Homeless person comes up, you know, and asks for a dollar. Now, do you give them a dollar? I don't know. It depends on the day, your mood, like, uh, you know, whether you have a dollar or not. Uh, you know, all of that stuff. It might depend on the energy of that person, that, you know, whether they smell or how they look or, you know, whether they're sort of like manic or whether they're calm. It might depend on any number of things, but it's a crapshoot. Like there's no, you couldn't necessarily bet on whether or not, you know, any given person will give a dollar. Now, if I said to you today, I have a friend from college, his name is Bob. He's a fantastic guy. He's fallen on hard times but he's like the sweetest man you'll ever meet. And he lives on your block. And today, when you go outside your house, you're going to see Bob and he's going to ask you for a dollar. I just know that he is. And I'm going to ask you <laughs> to just give him, you know, two minutes of your time. Just say hello. If you have a little money, that's great. Right. And so suddenly with that vouch, with me having opened the door just a little bit to make that homeless guy a little less homeless, a little more uh, you know, user friendly to you, the situation completely changes. And, and so, so part of the networking piece is really how do we in the industry make ourselves a little more of a known quantity to people? I think one of the ways we do that, you know, if you're talking about the Twitter analogy, one of the ways we do that is to fill out your Twitter profile have a really good picture, have a description of who you are, like give, give people a chance to understand you in some way. Right. The other thing is, in terms of the networking, we all know somebody. Some people are like, I don't know anybody. We all know people. Right. We went to we went to high school. We went to elementary school. Maybe we went to college. Maybe we went to drama school. Maybe we went to, you know, maybe we went to seminary. I don't know. But chances are there are people connected to those places who work somewhere in the industry. Right. So even if it's and we all sort of like roll our eyes when our mother says, oh, you know, Zelda's cousin Bob's, you know, ex-wife is an assistant for so-and-so. But those connections are real because it basically means that that person can vouch for the connection with you. So part of, the, part of our job, I think, is to do that research. Is there anybody from my college, my high school, my seminary, my drama school, whatever, who's out there in the industry, whoever they are, low, high, whatever, Find out whether you could talk to them and do a little bite-sized ask that says, hey, hey, Bob's ex blah, blah, blah. I'm so-and-so, and I heard you're an, an assistant for such and such. I've just moved out here. Or I'm trying to get into the industry. I would love to have, and I, I always recommend it be really prescribed, 30 minutes of your time, coffee. I'll pay for coffee, 30 minutes. I'd love to find out how you got to where you are. And there, there's not a person on the planet who doesn't want to tell their own story, right? So if you, so if anybody says, hey, tell me about you, like we do that, 
right? And so that's the space of networking that I think is really important that goes to what you were talking about, this sense of the entire industry is made up of people who vouch for other people. You know, whether you're high up the food chain or low, it's like, hey, you should talk to this person or this guy's a great writer or this person's a really sweet person or you ought to meet with blah, blah, blah. This person would be great on your staff. If you can't make yourself less homeless, you're going to have less of a chance to actually make those connections that you were talking about. Nice. Okay. So I got two comments on, on that tip. Really good tip. Um, number one, the idea of, uh, you know, the way you framed the homeless person originally, and then the way we, you, I thought of that homeless person after you said, oh, he's my friend and blah, blah. It's really interesting shift. And, and, and to me, the takeaway there is I, a lot of times when I do outreach, I forget to think of the other person as like a full human being right. with all sorts of frailties and, and strength. I tend to just look at the strengths and the great resume yeah. or whatever. And I put them on a pedestal as opposed to just um, not looking down, just fellow human, human yeah. being. Um, and, 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 and that is a really important reframing. See the whole person um, and just relate to them as like a person like you're, you're, you're in an elevator with or something. You know what I mean, you know, it's more than that, but like, but it's, that human level first and then the business and everything second. You know what I mean? So um, that's one takeaway I got from your tip. The other one actually I would push back on. I think that um, if I were to uh, reach out to, what would I like about the idea of uh, lean into your network? Absolutely. And everybody's got 500 friends on Facebook or whatever, yeah. right? Or, or LinkedIn. Yeah. Right? So there's tons of opportunities for sure. The, the, the adjustment that I would suggest is an even easier ask. Coffee and I'll pay for coffee is, is really, to me, a pretty big ask. And, you know, I can pay for my own coffee. So it's not that much of an incentive. Well, but it's the um, gesture. It's the gesture. It's like it, the, the idea of that, and I hear you, but the idea of that is it minimizes me taking advantage of you. It's not like yeah. you pay. Yeah, yeah. I'll, it's like to say, I'll go wherever you want and I'll, I'll buy coffee is at least a gesture that says, I respect your time. I respect your energy. And I'm willing to well, give back for what I'm about to get. You're, you're, you're adding a very significant part, especially for LA. I'll go to you and get coffee. That was, that was actually the bigger thing. Cause in LA, people that don't know, I mean, you know, it's, you know, 45 minutes to an hour to pretty much any side of town. Yeah, right. So if I'm going to go there and then have an hour long conversation and then back, that's three hours easy out of my yeah. day for a cup, free cup of coffee. No, thanks. Right. So, um, but for the right person in the right way, I might do it. Right. So, so to me, to me, and even, even like, if you can get that, that's fine. But I would suggest if you're going to go that route, go back to the, go to that cabinet question. Oh, you're an assistant uh, at some place at Amazon or whatever. Do a little research, check out their profile. Where do they go? And then ask them, just like, oh yeah, we're, you know, second cousins from whatever, blah, blah, blah. But that to me is, is like irrelevant. That just cracks your door open. Then it's ask them a fascinating question. What's the hardest part about being an assistant at, at your job? Or um, or what was, is it, um, is that really fun or is that really stressful? Or again, I'm off the top of my head, just, but you spend a little time, five or 10 minutes, you can brainstorm a really juicy question. And then you're relating as a human. And then from there, maybe it goes back, maybe I only like them. You're like, I don't even want to spend time with the person, but like, or, but it goes back and forth and you go, and then maybe you get a little rapport and then go, Hey, by the way, I really appreciate you. Um, is, is there any chance? Cause I'm new in town and I'm, I'm happy to drive wherever you want and I'll buy a cup of coffee or lunch or whatever. But if like, we could spend you know 20 minutes or half hour and I could just ask how about you, how you got that job at Amazon or whatever. To me, that's an easier way of doing it. Um, and, and in general, when I see people bumping and also then cycling down to why they don't like networking, it's because they tend to ask a little too much more yeah. often. So I, mean, I would err on the side of asking less. Yeah, so I hear that and I respect that. To me, the biggest thing in, in the entire equation though is that, which was interesting that you brushed it aside, is that thing of like, I'm Bob's cousins, blah, 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 right? To, to start with an actual connection that you actually have, because look, I mean, I'm, I'm always happy to have conversations like this. You know, you and I are, are good friends. You know, I, I have a Twitter presence. People reach out to me. Sometimes if I have time and the mood, blah, 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 I will respond to those things. Chances are I'm not going to spend a lot of time with those people I have, who, do, who I don't know at, at all. Right. That's that's the chance. But if they could say to me, I went to your high school and blah, 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 blah. And I know so and so to me, that cracks the door open much farther than than whatever that question is. And I think if it's if I do have some relationship with that person on some very small level, I might be willing to spend some time or, or a Zoom or a phone call to give some real information. 
Awesome. It's great. So, and, and here's another takeaway for you guys is that um, I think if we, if Steve and I got really specific about a particular ask, we would probably be probably closer, right? Cause you, you know, cause whether how close that relationship is, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a scale and what the actual ask is, there's a scale, right? So I think when it comes down to it, he and I would probably agree more than disagree on this, like a specific hypothetical, but that being said, we, we, we might not, Steve and I disagree about all sorts of things sometimes. So, um, so you need to sort of listen to other people and then make your own decision. But you, but the, the main thing is how, you know, if it's good is like, if it feels good, if you feel like you're, don't just think about yourself and how they can help you. It's really about, again, selling that conversation, helping them have like, you know, having some sort of good feeling about something they're doing. Um, and if you can think about it that way and be curious and think about them, you're more likely to sort of escalate that conversation organically and not yeah. annoy some. You know, it's interesting too, because it's just as a sort of a, you know, second level networking. I feel like there are two things that are, that, that, that in the best networking situation, ought to happen. Number one, after, after whatever that is, if you have that coffee or that conversation or whatever, I'm 100% like the thank you note guy, right? And if you, if you have, if you know somebody's office address, send an actual physical thank you note. Everybody in the world sends thank you emails. It's like cheap. It doesn't, to me, it doesn't mean almost anything, right? But if you send an actual handwritten note with your, like, and put a stamp on it, like, it's like Christmas. People are like, oh my God, who's, you know, and so it's a chance to be remembered twice. Now, if you don't have their address, but you happen to have- Hold on a second. Hold, let, let me jump in. I just want to vouch yeah. that Steve, I've seen Steve do this over and over again. He really it. is the master of, of snail mail thank you notes. Uh, yes, so yes. that's a totally legit tactic. Totally I at one point legit. thought about like leaving like candy bars or whatever that was very special uh and i never did it but steve actually does take this his own do advice too. and he always mails it out he's now, great there is, there is such a thing as over the top because like if you send somebody like you know a puppy or something then they're like that person is crazy <laughs> and i'm never going to meet with them again so you can't you can't overdo that but i think a gesture a small professional gesture is really great and the and the only other uh, corollary to that is if you don't have their address but you have an email you know send an e-card you know, like sign up for American Greetings or whatever. Send an e-card that shows up with a little, you know, animated thing and a little song. It's much better than just an email that says thanks. Uh, yeah, I would say so. And unless the caveat, I would say if you can punch something in the email, like there was one thing at the meeting that happened that you guys all laughed about, you know what I mean? And if you have like a topper for that joke and you can do the one line email, that could sure. be a nice, efficient way. Um, could be good. But, you know, yeah. But you're, you're not going to go wrong with Steve's approach. It, it's it's uh, as long as it comes from a genuine place. It's, right. it's a really good idea. That's the key. Um, okay. My final tip of the day is that um, for the game of selling your spec screenplay, it takes time. It takes time. Uh, not always, right? So I've sold three screenplays. The first one went out to the town. Nobody bought it. We're like, okay, we went back. And then we ended up... Uh, you know, packaging a little bit different way. We went back out to the town and then it sold, right? But that span of the first time out, the second time was probably about 18 months, almost two years maybe. Um, the second script I sold ended up going pretty quickly. We went live with it, I don't know, a couple of weeks or a month. It was bought with this preemptive offer. Um, the third one I sent, third one I sold was on the shelf for like four years, five years. And on the impulse, I was like, you know what? This producer, this seems like blah, 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 blah. I followed the impulse. Next thing you know, boom, sold it. It's That was going right. to production next year. Very cool. So, um, so the takeaway for you guys is um, just chill out. It takes time. Plant seeds. Just do, um, you know, it's like it might go fast, especially if you have representation and they can go wide with it. That's when those things can, you can maybe get a bidding war or something. But um, either if that happens and, and your reps go out with it and, and, you know, and they don't, and right, don't find a buyer right away, then you shift. Then you can do these other conversation-driven outreach tips. Uh, or if you don't have representation yet, you can do that. And it's great. It's fun. And you just, and, you know, a little bit each week, um, you know, if you, uh, if, for example, let's say you plant six of these seeds, six of these sort of potential conversations with people who are highly targeted to, to the shows and stuff that you love, the shows and movies you love. Um, you do six a week, you know, two out of those six get back to you. Now you have a conversation. And, and then the scope of you do that 50 weeks in a year, you're talking about, you know, probably damn near, you know, 100 conversations. You know, maybe it's not that much. Let's say it's even 75 or 50 conversations. I'm telling you, 
if your script is ready to be sold and you have 50 conversations with kindred spirits, that sh script should probably be sold. If not, it's probably the timing's off, right? It's probably a little too dusty or you know, the quality isn't quite there or just the timing's off. Like you love it for reasons that aren't what's right now because it's a timely business. Um, but this idea that Hollywood is closed off to people is um, not my experience at all. And I didn't grow up in the business. I didn't know anybody. Um, I just got to know people through socializing and them liking me and we, me liking them and it moved forward. Like, yeah. uh, yeah, well, except for Steve Harper, I pay Steve Harper. Uh, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> you know, I think one of the things that's such, it's a great tip and I love the whole notion of patience and the, the kind of patience that we can have sort of in the industry and with ourselves and with the process, I think is really key. Um, one of the things though, that I'm often aware of, and you tell me what you think of this, but I, I think it's really a, a useful thing to know for everybody out there is that there's one of the huge differences between television and film is that it, television is, you know, sort of an immediately collaborative process. So, you know, being on a television show is sitting in a writer's room for, you know, a ton of hours a week with a bunch of other people coming up with a story, you know, for say, you know, six to eight months of the year. So, you know, selling a film script is, you know, sometimes I know, like they'll buy your film script and then they'll say, see ya, and they'll never see you again. So there's a different, there's a, there's a fundamentally different kind of space of, I think in the television industry, you know, I'm not only, you know, selling my material to, as, as a sample of what I could do in a TV show, but I'm really selling myself. It's really about, because the idea of the showrunner is looking for somebody who they want to professionally hang out with. And that's fundamentally different from like, I love the energy of that script. It's a great thriller. It's perfect for the marketplace right now. You know, it's kind of like, do I want to sit in a room with this guy, you know, for, you know, 40 hours a week for eight months? Completely different calculus. I wouldn't say it's completely different, but I think it's, it's, it's significantly different, right? Yeah. So, you know, you're talking about really about team writing versus more like, just there's fewer cooks in the kitchen with a, with a feature. It's like, you, you know, you're, you're there. There's, there's still a lot of cooks if, you, if it gets a bigger project, right? A couple of producers, maybe the star, certainly the director, um, development guy at the company or whatever, you know, a creative exec. So it's, there's cooks in that kitchen for sure, but it's not like team writing like you guys do. Um, so, um, and like you said, you're right, especially if it's a studio film, I don't know, 95% of those writers get, um, you know, thank you very much, we'll see you, which is actually a good thing because why? Because if they fire you and they bring in somebody else, they're paying that person a lot of money and that means they're investing more in the project, it's more likely to get made. So uh, feature writers, when you get fired, celebrate it, it's actually a good thing. Um, your ego is gonna probably be bruised um, and ultimately, it's, it's great. You're more likely to um, get that project made. And when your project gets made, that's a significant career uh, milestone because it's just a huge advertising career, uh, ad advertising campaign for your career. I, I think one of the things that you and I are, are very similar on is the sense that sort of energetically, spiritually, if you will, we end up where we're supposed to be. And so the notion of, you know, I've lost jobs, I've walked away from things, you know, I've been let go from things. And it's sort of like, okay, if not this, what's the next thing? You know, this is, this is a path to that. So it's not that this industry isn't full of disappointments because it is and it can be. And the question is, you know, what's the next more ideal situation for me to, you know, to grow and be creative in and get paid really well to do it? Yeah, I love that. I love that. It's like, Every every opportunity, everything that happens, I have a I have a choice in how I respond. Yeah. And it's, there's so much power in my response to things. Um, you know, it was one of the things I learned from you. You know, a few years ago, you you got some TV job, and you're like, yeah, it was easy. I didn't like chase it down or anything. I was like, what? That's that's <laughs> even a way to do something. <laughs> what are you going? And um, but that's true. It's like um. Yeah, and, and not only that, as I've as I've applied that principle, it's a very law of attraction principle to every facet of my life. I just feel so much more empowered and so much more relaxed, and so much easier, and so much. Um, it, it really is a huge difference in terms of setting up my mindset to be. I, I create my response to objective reality, as opposed to if the deal goes through, yay, I'm great. If the deal falls through, oh, I'm terrible. It's yeah. that role. Excuse. There's inherent ups and downs, but you can choose how to lean into or away from the ebb and the flow. Yes. So you can, you can have a real sort of easy, consistent way of approaching the business, but it is a practice. You got to yeah. practice 
not being hooked into outcomes. 100%. I mean, I think I think of it similar to the weather. And there are people out there who are just completely emotionally affected by the weather. But it's sort of like, if, it's, if it rains, do I need to be sad about it? You know, like, or can I just be like, okay, it's raining and in a little while it won't be. And can I just keep moving on? Awesome. Uh, Steve, anything else for, for today? I think I'm complete, Brooks. This was a great conversation and I'm, I'm sure people out there have gotten a lot out of it. I, yeah, I, ho I hope you really have. Um, I love helping writers and I love talking to you, Steve, about all sorts of good things. So um, I'm really glad we got to have this conversation. Yeah, me too. Great to, great to do it. All right, Brooks. Hope it was helpful. See you, everybody. Yeah.